Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody to the Society of Professional Journalists New England Chapters Zoom meeting on keeping journalists safe while covering protests. There's been a lot of there in the field. And we're going to talk to uh, Lucy Westcott with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, Lucy, if you can introduce yourself and your level of expertise in what we're about to talk about today. Sure, thank you, Nikki. So my name is Lucy Westcott. I am the James W. Foley Fellow at the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, committee, to, committee to Protect Journalists is usually known by CPJ, the acronym. So my role is within the Emergencies Department at CPJ, and we respond to various safety threats that are facing journalists around the world. We've had an incredibly busy um, year. Uh, to, begin, to begin the year, we were focusing on uh, the run-up to the US election and the, you know, the covering of that election and the rallies and protests that would likely accompany it. Um, then we had the coronavirus, COVID-19, which uh, is a huge challenge for journalists and remains so. Um, and then we now have uh, protests across the US that are really unprecedented in terms of the number of press freedom violations that we've seen and the safety threats to reporters who cover them. So over the past 10 days, it's been rather volatile when, as people are covering uh, the protests of George Floyd's killing by, at the hands of Minneapolis police. Can you talk about some of the key themes you've seen over the past 10 days? Yes. So the uh, CPJ is working with the US Press Freedom Tracker to document, uh, I think the number this morning was more than 320 press freedom violation incidents during the course of these protests. So that is a, a truly staggering number. Um, and basically since May 26, I have been helping the team at the Press Freedom Tracker document those violations, talk to reporters, um, and hear their stories. So the police uh, around the US, they are responsible for about 80% of those press freedom violations. So that's arrests, um, tear gassing, pepper spraying, um, you know, assaulting journalists with shields or other weapons. Um, we have so far documented more than 54 arrests, 208 assaults, most by police, um, dozens of physical attacks and the use of pepper spray, rubber bullets um, and various other projectiles. And just so you know, the, the top cities so far that we've recorded violations in, um, Minneapolis, Washington DC, New York and Los Angeles. So it's also worth pointing out, and we'll get to this a bit later, that you know, protesters and members of the public have also attacked reporters uh, during these protests, but the, the vast majority is, um, has been done by the police. So on that note, um, across the US, you know, violence against journalists at protests, it, it's not a new phenomenon, um, but the scale and the scope of what we're seeing across the US is, is certainly, um, it's a challenging thing to respond to. So we're seeing at these protests a really quite aggressive and militarized police force. Um, I'm from the UK originally, and so I have an interesting perspective on this because I hear from my friends and family at home who say, oh my God, what are the, can you believe what's happening um, in the US? Why do the police look like that, right? They, they, these robocop police, these, you know, you can't often see their faces. The, there's so much armor. Um, in DC, we have seen these massive trucks that are being, that were used in, in war. So this is, it's a challenging thing as a reporter to, to report in that environment. Um, there is also, you know, an indiscriminate use, it seems, of various weapons. And we have also seen kettling, which is a technique that involves channeling protesters and journalists into a confined space. Um, they can't leave and then they are arrested. Um, so moving on from that, one of the other themes that we have seen that has been very distressing is the mm -hmm. disregard for press credentials or the role of the press. So we've seen many, many instances that have all been captured on video of journalists 
being confronted by police and saying, I am a journalist, I am covering this, I'm reporting this, here is my press badge, here is my press credential, and, and it just being completely uh, ignored. Um, we don't know why yet that's happening, we're just documenting these cases, but mm -hmm. it's certainly very worrying. Um, on the other side, we have, I have, sorry, did you have? Yeah, I was like, I yeah. just mean the cases, are journalists talking to you about their experiences as well? Yeah. Yeah. So we had one case where um, a journalist, she was, she had Washington DC police credentialed, press mm -hmm. credentials, but she was reporting here in New York. Um, a few days ago, there was kind of this standoff at the Manhattan Bridge here in New York that mm -hmm. was quite violent. And she showed an NYPD officer her Washington, T Washington DC press credentials. And he said, absolutely not get out of here. Um, the NYPD here also credentials the press. So there are now, you know, conversations around who should credential press and how that will be done from this point on. We are asking every journalist we speak to if they had press credentials on them and if they were visible. And the answer is usually yes. Um, we were wearing our press credentials as we usually would, and it hasn't really mattered in many of these cases. Um, we've also heard from a lot of photographers especially that they are getting a lot of agitation from members of the public and from protesters for their coverage of the protests mm -hmm. specifically they're taking photos of protesters and this is an ethical question that I think photographers and journalists have to have among themselves but in terms of uh, journalist safety when you're going out to cover the protest this is something to be aware of um, it's a very real threat to many people that if they are seen at a protest it could harm them in some kind of way um, but journalists should be aware of that photographers should be aware of that and and be able to answer um, the people who are asking those questions um, mm -hmm. and I would like to you know maybe hear from some people later on if they've had that experience in these protests or, or in others. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not your newsrooms have any type yes. of style or um, procedure when it comes to videotaping or taking photos of protesters. Uh, has this become a new topic? These are things that we would like to have some either involvement and engagement in or um, you can also drop it inside of the uh, chat box but just to keep that idea open have you considered how you record these things are you taking any special procedures to make sure you're not putting faces on there or is it all it's open because it is on a public area and it's a demonstration uh, what are some of the concerns about showing images of their faces though lucy from what i've heard from photographers who have been in that situation um they were told by protesters that you know the police could look at these photos and identify people at the protests and then the police could then follow up with these people who were there and it could it could cause them harm okay so fear of retaliation for fear of retaliation protesting. exactly gotcha. yeah um and it, and i was i was speaking with a photographer on Friday. I did a, an Instagram live Q&A with a photographer who has covered lots of conflicts globally but he's also covered protests here in the US and you know he said you don't have to take that photo. You don't have to take, if somebody says please don't take my photo, you don't have to. Um, protests are full of people. There's many opportunities for you to take photos. It's not worth um, that person being put at risk or you being put at risk by someone who, who might really not want you to do that. So Sometimes we get uh, a little bit bullish in our approach sure. and don't realize that this is a very volatile time. And we'll get yeah. into the whole psychology behind what's happening right now, but he's right. You don't always have to take that photo. Uh, not every last one of them is going to be the, the award-winning shot. And it may right. not be worth it because you might be able to establish some type of rapport and get a better photo down the road. I showed uh, a little bit of the press freedom um, in crisis tracker while you were speaking earlier because the images just kind of yep. pop and are more relevant. Um, let's go take a look at that. And you know, you can tell us like, what exactly are we, hold up, let me make sure I have it ready. There it is, Great. and share. 
and give you a wide screen. I went further into it, so let me go back a screen here. So when you go to your website, talk to me about what we're looking at here. Yes, so this is the US Press Freedom Tracker. Um, this was established, so this is CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists, is a founding member of this tracker. Um, mm -hmm. But we are, you know, we're, we work in partnership with them and I, I just, I can't stress <laughs> how wild um, this 320 plus number is. Um, this is what, this, this situation is what the tracker was set up for and we're in a really good place to, to document what's happening. But uh, as, you know, as, right yeah. I, I feel like this, uh, can you yes. break down? Right here. Thank you. Yeah. So that 300 plus number um, since May 26, that was the first incident we had. So that was the day after George Floyd was killed. Mm -hmm. um, since May 26, we have we have evidence of more than 300 incidents of press freedom violations around the US. Mm -hmm. So not all of those incidents yet have been verified and documented. Um, we, but we are working on it and at some point <laughs> they will be, they will all be on the website. So we have received the, you know, the information about these incidents. People have contacted us directly. We have got lots of them on Twitter and social media. Um, you know, journalists report, that's what they do. So journalists have been reporting their own assaults and attacks. Um, we will then follow up with them and, and get the full story. So Nikki is scrolling through and just to give you a, an idea, you know, so in Louisville, um, it was a protest uh, for justice for Breonna Taylor, I believe that, 20, yeah, 29th. So these are all separate incidents during that particular protest. Um, and, you know, there's been, a f there's been several viral videos that have come out of these protests of, of journalists being attacked. And one of them there is uh, the Caitlin Rust and crew. They were being shot at directly by police um, with, with rubber bullets. So the cameraman got, you know, the shot of the policeman directly firing at the camera, despite the yelling of press, press. Um, again, it didn't, it didn't seem to mean anything. Um, we break down the incidents, uh, you know, arrests, assaults, equipment damage, and we just really try and get a full scope of what's happening. And when people um, are shot at, we're talking like a, a riot type of uh, ammunition, rubber bullets, uh, gas, tear gassing, and stuff. Pepper spray, um, yes, and. I am, I am at the beginning of reporting a story on, you know, about the types of weaponry that are being used, um, mm -hmm. but, it, but pepper, pepper spray, rubber bullets, and foam bullets, because people have tweeted and, and they're, they're about that big and they have foam on top. So yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to get a fuller picture okay. on that. Um, and just to give you, you know, the first incident that was recorded, it was two journalists in Minneapolis, Andy Mannix, who uh, he writes for the Star Tribune, was hit with a rubber bullet, and a journalist from Unicorn Riot, which is a, a non-profit news outlet that has been doing really fantastic coverage in Minneapolis. They were both struck by projectiles. And then from there, it continues. We're still getting cases in, and we will for a long time. So let's start talking about safety. You know, how can journalists out in the field keep themselves safe and what should managers be looking for? Um, let's go with physical safety first. Sure. So um, the, I have a bunch of links and I will send those to, to Nikki and Adam after so, they, so you can share them. Um, but we have a safety advisory for covering the protests. We issue safety advisories around specific events. So mm -hmm. these particular protests, you know, if the World Cup, um, for example, the election um, just because there's different um, safety needs around all these events. So protests are, they're unpredictable, right? They're high risk events. Um, I don't know how many people here have covered protests before. I see there's not a lot. Yeah, they're rather yeah, but, quiet. You guys can put in yeah. the if you have. I have, I've <laughs> yeah. covered standoffs and I've had to run for my life at least once, so yeah. Yeah, they, they are, um, they are, they, in the, you know, in the US, a lot of the press freedom violations so far have happened in major cities, right? But that doesn't mean that they, they can't happen in, in smaller towns, smaller cities. So 
the most important thing is to is to read read ahead and prepare so you should not at a protest be expected to work alone if you can avoid it um the reason for that is that when journalists are reporting, your situational awareness tends to be at the job at hand, right? So you are finding people to interview. If you're a photographer, you are documenting everything. If you're a multimedia journalist, you're doing all of these things at the same time. Um, if there's, you know, police forming down the road, you might not be able to see that until it's too late. Or if someone is chucking something, your uh, awareness is in your viewfinder. Yeah. So it's best and safest to work in teams if possible and I know that's not always possible but it should you know let's try and do that um, PPE personal protective equipment we've been hearing a lot about that because of COVID and now we're hearing about it again with um, the protests so because the coronavirus is still a very real threat you should be wearing a mask um, an N95 mask if possible, but really a mask would be great. Um, like in not a makeshift mask. You need something that has a filter to it. I mean. What's the ideal? We, I would say, I mean, I don't want to put anyone at risk by um, suggesting one thing over the other, but I would say an N95 mask with a filter in this situation, in a protest mm -hmm. situation, is safer than having something that is a cloth mask. Yes. Right, I, I would say that that's fair. Um, you know, the risk, uh, there is a risk of tear gas, obviously, and a, and a, and a mask will a mask and goggles um, will be able to protect you a little bit in that situation. Again, maintaining that situational awareness um, is important to avoiding much harm happening to you. Um, Another thing is to think about yeah. having a spare. Um, I remember yes. reading the, the precautions for those who wear hijabs, and mm -hmm. um, I say hijabs, uh, the, head, the headgear for Muslim women. Yes. And if they get sprayed with something, then that, chem that chemical can stay alive inside of that, that fabric. So right. in the same manner, it's like you want to have a backup mask in the event that you do find yourself in the midst of some type of tear gas situation. And yeah. then you can't get away from it if that's your only protection right there. Right. That's a really good point, actually. Having spares, it can't hurt. They don't take up much room. Um, and it'll make you feel better, I think. Um, a quite, a quite um, grim point, but one that is worth bringing up is, so we initially posted our safety advisory the night of May 31st, so that was last Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we updated it two days later to include a point on um, the risk of vehicular ramming. Um, that is a, it's a risk at protests, um, we, we saw it at the Unite the Right rally in Virginia in 2017. Um, and there have been a, a couple of, there was an incident in Virginia a few days ago and uh, there was a large truck driven into protesters in Minneapolis last week as well. So again, this I'm not trying to scare anyone and I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but when you're out in a protest, and you're preparing for it, that should just be something at the back of your mind. Like this just has been a constant threat since uh, yeah. Charlottesville, you know, right. when it comes to people using a vehicle as a weapon. Correct. While they might be trying to make a getaway, you know, those are bodies that are being rolled over. So yep. you as a journalist, you need to be very, it goes back to your very first tip about being aware of your surroundings. Yep. And, um, you know, just where the danger could possibly be coming from because a notepad, a, a smartphone, a camera is not going to save your life. You need to be very aware. Sadly, we're kind of dealing with almost third world uh, war-torn country circumstances here in the United States right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's this, uh, I, it's advice that, you know, I've, I've only ever worked as a journalist in the United States. Um, and it's certainly not something that I ever thought, you know, it's just it was not part of working in the US and being a journalist here. But, but, but now it is, but, but now it is. And it's, it, this is, this is where we are. So it's, you know, it's good to prepare and be safe. Um, I've been reminding people that it's starting to look a lot like, and keep in mind, I didn't see 1967, but you're starting to see a lot of the um, very aggressive tendencies to war protesters that you saw 
during the civil rights movement with people getting right. their heads cracked open on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and with right. um, dog, well, there's no dogs being stuck on anybody, but with hoses right. and whatnot, like that was then. And now today it's like you're watching full on rubber bullets and canisters being shot at right. journalists amidst the, the crowds of protesters. It's right. kind of taking away from the whole peaceful part. It's, yeah, it's very yeah. disturbing. Um, Let's talk so, about the, um, yeah. the psychological end. Sure. So, and safety that way. Yes. So, again, we have some, some safety advice about protecting your psychological health um, on our website, and I will make sure that link is, is with the right people. Um, mm -hmm. So, it's important that I think sometimes as journalists, and I have certainly been guilty of this myself, um, you know, you, you go into this job and you think you're, you're really tough and you can cover anything and nothing, you know, it's your job to be out there and report on things that are frightening and that have real effects and impacts on people's lives. But you are also a human being um, and it is very normal to be affected by the things that you you know, the things that you report on, the people that you interview and their stories. Um, and I know that this sounds like a, a really basic thing to say, but I think it's important to just remind ourselves that covering an event like a protest is a high risk, potentially violent event. And as a journalist, it now appears in at least the cases that we've seen that there isn't a lot of protection um, for you in your role as a member of the media so you can get caught up in what is a high risk potentially violent event and it's scary um and it's it's very normal to have you know we have on our website the kind of warning signs to look out for but um, mm -hmm. increased irritability trouble sleeping um a loss of the things that you usually find that help you these are all things to just be aware of um not things to be proud of either when people are saying like look at all the, the pain and the suffering and the stress i'm taking right. it's like no these are not things you want to be excited about these are things you want to right. use as red flag warning signs it's time to go talk to somebody yeah i mean speaking personally i spent a solid week last week i did not have a week i, I had a weekend this weekend and it was great but at the end of last week I had all the warning signs and, um, and I just needed a break and it's okay to take a break and it's also okay to take a break from the news. Um, what's been quite challenging about the past few months is that we're living in unpre unprecedented, like that word, unprecedented times. <laughs> and, and you want, like, you want to read everything you can about COVID. You want to read everything you can about the protests and watch every video. And, and, and it doesn't um, help. That news will still be there tomorrow. Yeah. And we're in this now for the long haul. Um, and it's important to not burn out, basically. So if you can, I would just encourage um, communication with your editor or manager. Um, it is nothing to be ashamed of, and it's completely normal to feel affected by this stuff. And so, burnout is real. And burnout is very real. <laughs> burnout is very real. And especially, uh, we're doing this in after having been locked down for many months, to having our normal routines really affected, yes. um, and reporting in our homes on things that are very challenging. So, of course, it's going to affect you. Yeah, there's a lot of disorienting factors in that because for, for most of us working from home and finding ways to, you know, make it lo come live at home, uh, yeah. you're still distant. And then you finally, you're going out, but you're going out into a war zone in the span of a couple blocks. A lot of what happened yeah. in Baltimore in 2015 happened within the space of about three blocks. Yeah. But you wouldn't know that by watching the images on air. But the, the actions that were happening, once you start seeing canisters and rubber bullets and things like that coming at you, these are things that are going to keep you shook for a second. And you might yeah. start getting a little skittish when you hear familiar sounds and whatnot. This is not something to self-medicate uh, with. Right. Yeah. And I, I think just to kind of, I, I, I spoke to a photojournalist who um, covered, he, he's covered many conflicts but he al he also was covering covid in um connecticut which is his home state and i was talking to him about this do you think it's going to be very traumatic for photographers to cover things that are in their backyard and he said yes but 
because everybody is experiencing it together it's quite different than say uprooting yourself and going to Iraq or Syria or something where you had that experience there and no one at home understands at least you know <laughs> yeah so yeah. just on like a positive kind of different framing of it I think you know that that can help like we're all in this together yeah <laughs> but in a very chaotic place <laughs> yes <laughs> and if anything just you know going to be ingrained for a while you may not know right now initially but please yeah. you know give yourself time to recollect um, to collect if family members and loved ones around you are telling you that you're you know you're not yourself you know like the snickers commercials but extremely more intense that might yeah. be a time to you know take that insurance and go talk to somebody it's not a bad yeah. thing it's actually beautiful yeah. let's talk about safety online when covering protests you know because we're all yeah. surrounded and now literally you can't get away from it on your phone Yes. So uh, before my life was uh, COVID and the protests, my life was online, de responding to online harassment. So um, that was kind of my specialty and my expertise. And I have done a lot of research about that for journalists here in the US and also journalists in Canada and specifically women, um, as it's something that disproportionately affects women, uh, female journalists. So the first case that I mentioned um, on the tracker, Andy Mannix at the Star Tribune. So he, he, he had a double whammy of um, press freedom violations, I guess. So he was, he was hit by a rubber bullet and then he was harassed online for his reporting. So he, was, um, he got death threats and he was doxxed. Um, and I'll explain what that is in a minute um, for taking photos of protesters and then uh, I think he tweeted why he thought that you know why yeah. photographers need to take photos of protesters and that, so again these are separate conversations but um so doxing is when your personal information like your address your personal phone number your cell phone number your personal email address the names of your family members uh their personal in personal information it's when that information is made publicly available online and then used against you so I could go on about this for hours and I won't <laughs> because okay. it's quite scary but uh it's but I mean, really it's necessary to people but it's, it's, yeah but it's I'll, I'll give I'll give the cliff notes version it's mm -hmm. really important to realize that there is probably a lot of information like that about you online and you might not know it so there are websites that buy and sell this data it's data that you enter when you buy something online or you order food online and then it ends up on a database somewhere um, I will send out links to how you can take this stuff down but mm -hmm. but basically there are programs that you can use that send blanket opt-out requests to these websites it's websites like white pages people finder you know or there's a million of them there's that new england facts.com i found my address on there why i don't know it was just there um but you can get all these places to to remove it um you do it's just it's just good basic hygiene digital hygiene to lessen the likelihood that something like that will happen um you know we've seen incidents of local reporters covering covid covering the protests people don't like those stories people want to do harm to the people who are reporting on them because they might not agree with the stories that are being written mm -hmm. and it's really it's really damaging when that um when that happens there was an extreme case of that back in um well i shouldn't say extreme but it was another case of that back when uh wesley lowry was covering ferguson yeah um he's from ohio if i'm not mistaken and they put his mother's address out there yeah uh, this is very old school like intimidation methods yeah. and we're seeing it come from all directions so you don't even know who it's going to be you don't know if there's going to be a political party doing it you don't know if it's going to be protesters unhappy with your coverage either way like you your first priority really should be you know your home life and making yeah. sure that that is safe so while we're out here playing Captain America, then, you know, Clark Kent at the same time trying to, like, you know, tell the story and be the best journalist ever, don't forget, you have loved ones yeah. at home. You really don't want to put them in danger just because somebody didn't like a headline, a photo, yeah. or a one-minute, 15-second package. That's your problem. Yes. And 
I know it goes against our instincts as journalists to want to make ourselves available right so we want to make we want to you know keep the dms open and put our cell phone number in our email signature because people can get in touch with us that way but there are other ways um uh, you know uh, for your phone number take your number yeah. off of that resume that's on linkedin I yes mean, you totally have everything else available to you you don't have to have a phone number on there yeah. in fact that actually dates you and makes you look a little bit more um, advanced in age if you put your phone number on things that are available digitally because right. I can Google your phone number I'm going to bother you harass you and yeah. tell you how much I'm ready to come hurt you contact form on a website as well rather than having that an, an address or something um, it just allows you to filter these things out um, and yeah and I would say also you know yes it can be it, journalists covering politics protests coronavirus these are all sort of these are topics that would perhaps make you a target but it could also i spoke with a journalist who was harassed online because she covered taylor swift really so, yes yeah. so, <laughs> so taylor swift has fans similar to the beehive with beyonce then <laughs> it would suggest it would suggest it so my point is that yeah. even if you're even if you're beat you wouldn't think it would result in that you just you never know the internet is a horrible place sometimes and you just yeah. don't want to get caught up in it um and then in terms of of going to so that's you know if you're covering a protest and and the harassment can come afterwards um i would also point you and we have another resource for this and i'll share the link but just being aware that when you go to a protest you might not want when you cover a protest you might not want to take your personal phone um not not only you know if you have a work phone that's great or another phone if you can bring that not only because of the potential damage that can be done to your cell phone and it's it's everything right it's it's a reporting tool it's how a lot of people take their photos and videos mm -hmm. but the police can also access it in the event that you're arrested you might have s sensitive information on there mm -hmm. so if you do have to take your main phone just consider deleting apps that you don't want accessed just making it have as little information on there as possible it's just a general rule of thumb no that's a totally great tip um one uh tip i gave to a friend whose daughter her, her 16 year old daughter was going to go out to protest actually mm. and they're like well what are tips that you want to give to teens and i was like okay gotta be honest with you i know that most of us do not memorize phone numbers anymore Right. write it down on an old-fashioned yes. paper um because again if your phone gets confiscated if it goes dead because keep in mind all the messages and i mean all the uh, activity in that area might drain your phone right. trying to send the text you want to at least make sure you can call home and in our case make sure you can call back to you know your your station your uh newspaper wherever you're trying to call back like hey listen i'm out yeah. of here and yeah. yeah if you don't have your phone leash you can go and borrow somebody else's phone and you have those numbers available right. too and in as we are all journalists um i don't know who here is familiar with the reporters committee for freedom of the press or rcfp oh yeah keep that yes. number <laughs> so yeah. that, <laughs> that number that, yes they have a, a legal hotline um I will find it and send it in my lovely package of links, but that's the number that <laughs> reporters should have on their arm in Sharpie. Um, that's the one you, you, you're going to want to call in the event of an arrest. And let's be realistic. Like, I don't know how many small markets there are in um, Boston or how the hiring practices are throughout New England, but the younger your staff is, the more impressionable they are when it comes to somebody being able to tell them that, well, I have the right to take your phone. I have the right to take, whatever, I have the right to take your camera. And they may not know their right. So um, if you're in a managerial position, please take this information and you know dispense it to your staff. If you're a newbie somewhere out there, realize that you have rights, but uh, speaking as a black woman here, people like to take your rights away a lot. So be prepared for that type of thing and have some recourse because sometimes it won't be your words. So we're trying to give you tips to just be prepared or as um, the scouts are, you know, always be prepared that's a safer way than what about my rights they, you might have somebody who's not caring about your rights and then you have a problem yeah um we talked about knowing when it's time to go knowing yes. time to leave. let's go into this one um, yeah <laughs> yes so again it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier that like there can be 
and again I know I've been guilty of this of being thinking that I am exempt from any danger because I am a journalist and that is I my phone and I have a phone <laughs> and it's my job to be here and nothing bad will happen to me and that's wrong so during a protest again they're unpredictable situations things can turn uh, on an instant and you need to be prepared for that so knowing when to leave okay so you're in a protest you you've gotten what you need right you do not need to be there for the entire protest if you you got to use your senses and this goes back to situational awareness do you hear a scream do you hear increased shouting or what sounds like some kind of escalation look at the police are the police forming into some kind of line are they putting on a mask helmets are they getting their riot shields up these are all general indications that something is about to happen that could put you at risk um, these are red flags if you feel in your gut that it is time to leave trust that gut instinct and just get out of there yeah, because at that point, there's going to be very few um, distinctions between, okay, a member of the press and a person that's out here with uh, protest or unrest. And I use the example of um, the last time the Ravens won the Super Bowl. I went to hang out with everyone else down Fells Point, and it was fun. And you saw the cops around, and it was fun. And then you saw the cops get more numbers. And then you saw the horses, and then you saw the shields. And then I said, it's time for me to go. Um, I'm good. You don't have to hang around to get everything. And if you do, you better stay in whatever the press designated area is. Um, but then it becomes a question of what happens when they breach that area, right. when they don't provide space for the press to cover an event. That's where you run into problems because it's your job to cover these things, but you need to be in a safe place to do it. Being hit by rubber bullets and here again, really not a safe place to do it and professions, law enforcement, and the press. Yeah. Lately, it's been a very blurring of the relationship. And it seems that at least from the, the journalists I've spoken to so far for the tracker, for the cases that we are documenting, they don't necessarily, a lot of them don't think that they've been targeted. It's just that the police couldn't, again, make that distinction. They couldn't see, and they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, in many cases, they have been targeted, but in many, they haven't, and they were still injured. They still have a huge welt on the back of their arm or whatever. Um, in many cases, well, not, uh, eyesight has been lost, um, or journalists and photographers have had to undergo surgery because they have been hit with a gas, a tear gas canister or something. So th there are real risks. Um, there are real risks. So leave when you can. Yeah, it's not... Again, back to the quote from the photographer, like, you don't have to get that shot. Yeah. Um, you know, there are safer distances. Uh, I've been mentoring students that just graduated, sorry, recent grads, excuse me, from college. <laughs> <It's anymore. laughs> and as they go through their adventures, it's like, I'm having, like, deja vu remembering, you know, okay, I remember yeah. being a standoff. I remember being told, you stand over here. And I followed all those directions because I didn't want to get hit with a stray anything, okay? Right. Then when you have protests, you know, again, protests used to be understood. You say over here, you can get the action. We're not going to hurt you from the, from the cops and yeah. from the protesters. Nobody's going to hurt you. Things have changed. Uh, the tips that we were talking about today are, and, it, and the idea is to keep you safe yeah. and to realize that for some reason, our breach, our contract, our understanding of what we are to, there to do is not always being respected by law enforcement and frankly is not always being respected by protesters either mm -hmm. so you know if if you're out there from a news organization that's not favored by a protester you might have a problem you yeah. need to be aware of your surroundings and to be oblivious and pollyanna-ish out there that could be dangerous mm -hmm. um we are getting into the whole question and answer part of our you know whole 15 minutes today um because <laughs> we wanted to you know give space for what are you guys feeling? You know, um, you know, have you been covered? Have you covered previous protests? Maybe not the Black Lives Matter uh, reaction with George Floyd, but there has been protests in the past. Do you see the difference in the escalation and law enforcement somehow just the relationship is just gone and we're now, you know, we are not the enemy, but somehow we are now again. And um, do you have an exit strategy to get out safely? Because we did talk to you guys about 
when it's time to go, you need to go. Like, there's really no need to sit there and do a, a you know, a martyr moment. Just get out. You can get the rest of the story later on. And um, I'm really curious as to how do they feel about showing protesters' faces on camera. Yeah. Because that's going to be something that splits a lot of newsrooms. It depends yeah. on how they work. Oh, yeah. Let's unmute. Mute, unmute everybody. Let's have a party. The best you can have talking about something as heavy as this. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, it's a helicopter just outside. Oh, no, you're not wrong at all. Lots of like, protests here. So, for the most part, you guys are unmuted, and we'd like to invite you to please, you know, talk to us about your experiences out there in the field. Uh, what are you noticing? And, frankly, what are some of your concerns? Because I know I'm getting a little nervous, mm -hmm. seriously, for... Um, you know who's being sent out to a lot of these protests. They're the most greenest people ever. You know, right. Super new. And this is a lot. And yeah. a lot plus a, a pandemic. Plus a pandemic. Don't okay. forget. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so you're already nervous about your health. Oh. <laughs> now somebody's shooting at you. I mean, there's a yeah. lot going on there. Let's see. I thought I saw Antonio say something. Yeah. He just made a noise. Okay. And I guess I'll just say, like, if um, if you don't have any questions or concerns now, CPJ is always there for you <laughs> to answer anything at a later date. And we have people who can answer, like, very, very specific questions that I might not be able to. Mm -hmm. um, and they are, all, they are always there. So, you know, I offer myself, if you ever want to email me with any questions at all, or just say, how do I go about doing this? Just let me know and I can connect you. Um, I know the manager in me is like, um, the advice I've been giving to people, like this is their very first protest. I'm like, ooh, this is a hard one. ER, uh, ER yeah. <laughs> ship, uh, raised hand. Oh. Hi there. Now, I was gonna yes. kind of make, yes. yeah. make an observation. Yeah. Um, I don't really do too much hitting the streets covering protests anymore, but I've done my share in the past. One of the things is that younger journalists find that this is a way to build their reputations. So they're the ones more likely to take the chances. Mm -hmm. And so somehow you need to impress upon the younger journalists that it's not being cowardly or any of that stuff when you do lead. Um, uh, and, and there's always the fear that you're going to miss the big part of the story. That's the other thing too, right? So yeah. when you're just starting out, you're not quite sure. So I, the, I guess the answer to that part of it is to stay in touch with whoever you're working with and for uh, yeah. so that at some point you can say, I think I got enough. Yeah, my advice has been, um, and you all saw, I like really got nervous with the CNN event um, with Omar Jimenez and his group particularly because we know him in Baltimore. Um, mm -hmm. We are very familiar with him. And then also, you know, I'm not even a mom. I went to black mama mode where I'm thinking, okay, he's a very large black guy who just got taken away by cops. I'm a little nervous right now. They obviously didn't right. respect the press badge mm -hmm. and that didn't offer any layer of protection. Nice. And while some people were commenting on Facebook, oh, his career is made now. I'm like, I'm thinking, but is it it's is it really? And then the other thing is like, do you, if this was your friend, your child, your anything, would you want him hauled away by cops knowing how these circumstances don't tend to go well? The whole protest is about a big black guy being taken down by the cops and it didn't go well. So these are things where it's like, okay, you can live to fight another day. I think Professor Shep is really hinting at you don't have to make your career that day, <laughs> okay? Right. And I would say, you know, one of the other um, tips that we have is to ha is to definitely have a check-in procedure with your editor or another colleague. So ideally, you and someone else are mm -hmm. together reporting, and you can say, you know, I've got this much, I've got this many interviews. What does it look like from the outside? I'm mm -hmm. thinking of leaving. Do you think that's a good idea? rendezvous points as well um rendezvous points as well it's almost Absolutely. like when you were a kid and they were like all right if your phone isn't working or your page or whatever you were when a kid um yeah. if your phone isn't working you know to meet here at this time and you can make that with your teammate out there in the field you might be covering different aspects of the protest but know that you have a rendezvous point and if you don't see that person then then call back to this call back to your job call back to the station let them know 
we have a question from Adam. Um, do you recommend journalists get the names of police when they are detained but not arrested? Uh, I know in some places police are required to document incidents when they stop people at gunpoint, but not everywhere. Um, I mean, yeah, if, if I, I know that in some places, um, police officers have, have obscured their names and their badge numbers. Um, They're putting electrical tape over their badge numbers. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, from a, from a documenting press freedom violation standpoint, yes. Um, if you can, I would certainly try and get the name of, of the officer. I know that that's not always possible. And I would say as long as it's safe to do so. Um, just in terms of being, you know, having the most information and being as transparent as possible. Yeah, it's also a heartbreaker when you find out that um, you don't have a supportive newsroom either, or newsroom management as well. Um, one of the posts on the um, Women in Broadcasting yes. page on Facebook, yeah. uh, a woman said, you know, uh, the sheriff's office called to complain about an interview she did. And this is just non-protest time. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the sheriff's office could call and, you know, pretty much now she's getting reprimanded by her boss, it becomes one of those questions of, well, okay, what happened to the dialogue or the conversation with you and your boss about why you had that line of questioning? Why are you automatically getting reprimanded? And let's be honest, in some places, in some shops, there's a friendship between law enforcement and your management. If that's mm -hmm. a situation, I strongly suggest, uh, you know, keeping their resume fresh and being ready to move when it's time. I have a, a, another thought popped into my head related to that. And then we have a question, um, a really good question. So, you know, we've seen, a few, we've seen many incidents of, of people without um, the, the police not acknowledging press credentials or anything. Mm -hmm. It's best to just have something, right? So if you go to a protest, just have the press credentials so that you can say, if you're arrested, I had these on me. It's, I think, the same with getting the name of the police officer. If you can, at least you have the name. And it will, mm -hmm. it will be some kind of protection for you down the road if anything happens. I just wanted to, to, to go back to that. Um, we have a question from Bansari Kamdar. What about immigrant reporters? of which I'm one myself, um, there is a lot of murkiness regarding reporting as a foreign reporter, particularly as criminal charges could be grounds for deportation. Mm. Yeah, that's so, Ben, sorry, I would. But uh, here's the thing is that your, your, your company, your, you should not be held from doing this coverage, but they should understand that that is a possible threat. I don't yeah. know about how um, immigration law goes, so you're gonna have to help me out, this Lucy, because it's like if you're doing your job, it's like it shouldn't be a problem. But you don't want to have people out here risking their status in the country to do a story when they right. get into another aspect of the coverage. I mean, that is a that is a very important conversation that you need to have with your editor um, or newsroom management because the, you know, if if you are arrested, that can have big impacts on your future ability to, to, to remain in the country, to work in the country, to get future form. And I'm, I'm speaking anecdotally here from what I understand as being an immigrant here. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to, to connect you, um, Bansari, with somebody who can answer that question properly. So let's try and connect after this. But I would say, oh. yeah, but I would say again, um, as long as you have something on you that that clearly identifies you as press, um, that will at least give you some kind of, of protection. Um, I, yeah, but I want to make sure that that answer that question is answered properly. Um, and then Adam's question: Have you seen instances where reporters were given digital press credentials? How does CPJ feel about news outlets issuing these? Okay, by could you explain what you mean by digital press credentials? Actually. Like going through uh, TSA with the, you know, scan the QRQ looking type of thing, something on your phone. Oh, something on your phone. I'm, I'm thinking that's a setup. We talked about this earlier. That's a setup for a big problem. Uh, <laughs> like you got to pull out your cell phone to identify yourself as a journalist. You already, sadly, you already don't look like a journalist because huh. they're seeing an old fashioned laminated uh, press pass. And here you come with something like you're about to board early on, uh, you know, Delta. Airplane. Yeah. Uh, this is not the time. <laughs> you don't have time. 
but this is really not the time to do this. I have not, I have not come across any instances yet where we have seen that. And I think it's just for the reason that you gave Nikki is that they probably, I mean, I, there was an example and I, because I have hundreds of incidents in my head, I can't remember where it was, but it was a, a journalist who had previously covered, I think, Ferguson. And she was arrested during Ferguson and her newsroom issued her like an A4 piece of paper sized press pass that's not a press pass i know <laughs> but, but i know it's a piece of paper in, in, ad- in addition to her traditional press credentials just so it was so big that it said i am press so <laughs> there's many different ways of doing this it seems like the um the paper route is best but i'm going to look into digital press credentials because i have to say i have not come across those instances any okay. instance um, adding to the conversation, uh, again, wow. again, black person had on here, you don't want anything that has you reaching for anything. Like that's where a lot of our problems are already coming from is that we're already trained by our parents that we get stopped by law enforcement. It's like hands in all, you know, visible area, hands up, don't shoot. is not a joke. It's for real. So the idea of having to dig for anything, <laughs> like the press pass needs to be very, well displayed and you pray to god that they actually respect it for once but no i i am so anti with the whole let me go digging for my cell phone we have cases black lives matter cases of people getting shot over a cell phone where it's thought to be a weapon so again no not a good idea do not do don't do not do now do it later do not now yeah okay um i have a question yes hi it's jordan um Thanks so much for doing this, by the way. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about Lucy about the qu- the recent questions you've been getting, like CPJ has been getting about protests since they started? Yeah. Um, so we've been getting a lot and they have mainly been around um, legal counsel. So having someone available at short notice to respond if a journalist was arrested. And we have also been getting a lot of questions about PPE, um, which suggests to me that a lot of US-based reporters have not had to report in situations like these before. And those are really good questions because, you know, if you've never had to cover a violent protest before, how would you know? So um, we have information on our website about the kind of PPE that we, um, that, that journalists should look into um you know it what is good in this situation is to do some research and speak to other reporters about what they have worn um at the moment you know a, a decent mask gloves because of covid and taking lots of hand sanitizer with you is really the way to go um in terms of like ballistic vests or bulletproof things you you, you're probably not looking at that right now um those things are heavy they restrict your movement and it's not that um we're not quite in that conflict situation that that requires those those are the main those are the main themes that we've been getting and then i guess you know comparing it to other protests um that have happened here and this is again the number of incidents um, has has been unprecedented. So I'm reading up um, on the case where they had the electronic credentials or the link in the chat. Okay. And um, reading through it, I I'm not going to assume too much. I'm assuming, but I'm going to say this: Is he help me out, Adam? Is he a black guy too? Willis Harrison Wills, whatever. Oh, I, I think Adam's muted. Adam, you're muted. You can talk now. Yeah, no, it's Hasten Willis. Uh, he's he's not. Uh, Poor he's not. guy, though. Okay, so he's wow. a stringer for the Washington Post, and they sent him with digital credentials. A freelancer. That's what he said. Yeah. Oh, so he's a free. So he's a freelance. Okay, that's interesting. Yes. So I wonder if if it's freelancers because again, if we haven't even somehow. I mean, obviously, freelancers in this situation are, are, are facing all kinds of threats. Um, they don't have the, you know, because they lack that traditional newsroom support. That's really interesting. Well, I, I can speak as a digital editor and yeah. I used to send my people out on the weekends in particular, weekends and evenings, cause that's when they were available cause they were freelancers, right? They got yeah. other jobs. Um, I used to 
number one, I was in a job for like two months and I begged to get my freelancers press credentials that looked yeah. like press credentials. And this was in the city of Philadelphia when I was a digital editor for the Philadelphia Tribune. Okay. Um, they were running into problems covering because if you know Philly, you know they like to protest a lot and demonstrate a lot. So yeah. again, they're out there and it's the same dynamic where if you can't be identified easily as a member of the press, you are going to get harassed. Right. And I had a very diligent staff that wanted to go out there and work for me. And that's why I had to get all up in the, of my manager saying, hey, I need these guys to be able to move. You need to have advocacy within your agency. I understand why they don't want to give out, um, most places don't want to give out like a temporary badge or temporary press pass for a fear of people um, misusing them. But I guess, you know, after a, a probationary period of sorts, please send your, your staffs out there equipped. That was Philly during a normal year. I could not imagine, like, I was kind of like peeking in because I'm curious. So I was peeking in on some of my old staffers and they were like out and about covering all the many protests, uh, George Floyd protests. And they were saying, you know, I was like, well, aren't you glad that your digital editor got you those badges last year? And one of my freelancers said, I lost my badge and it's taken about six months for them to finally get me a new one. Yeah. You want them out there getting the stories and you need to prepare them, you know, buy them the mask, right. give them a pass. And, you know, show some support so that they don't feel like they are really out there by themselves. That's not a safe place to be. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for sending this in the chat. It's, it's really helpful and it will really help um, the tracker as well, I think, to know this. Yeah. Well, I, um, I think we're done for their questions. I don't see any. I'm hoping I didn't miss any, but I don't see any others. And we are coming, well, we are at the top of the hour. So we are. it's a great point to wrap it up. And I think that this has been a very thoughtful and very helpful uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, again, for yeah. everything and all your links that you're going to throw in there so we can have it for yes. this. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me. It's been great. And I will, I will send Adam those links and he can send them in an email. So yeah. thank you so much. You can always reach out to the Society of Professional Journalists, the New England chapter. For any of this content, uh, the video will be posted on their YouTube page. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. No, no problem. So y'all can um, stop your recording.